Jackal among snakes saw author, Nemorosus, chapter 141, steel tempered by tyrants. In the alleyways of Sethia, someone crawled away on their knees, veritably pulling themselves forward using the walls. They pushed aside rubble, heaving, then eventually collapsed against a building, breathless. Ha! Ha! The man breathed. Covered in grime, dust, and sand, the man was entirely nude. He was ridiculously skinny, appearing both dehydrated and starved. His hair and eyes were brown. His skin was the color of copper. If any of the residents of the city saw him, they would know he was unmistakably the Lord of Copper. Brim did not consider himself a fool. He knew when he had lost a battle. His enemies waited beyond, letting the elves tear at him like wolves hunting a lion. All of his allies were vanquished. His death was inevitable. As such, rather than perish, he elected to commit the only cardinal sin for vessels of Felhorn, severing his connection with the ancient god. Two vessels before Brium had done such a thing. It was an abominable act, and all who had done it had died miserably. Brium was no more than a mortal man. Now, he looked much older than he once did, near forty, his true age. He was weak, friendless, and surrounded by people hostile to him. But he was alive, and that alone was sufficient. After having caught his breath, he tried to rise to his feet. Something stopped him from doing so. Brium raised his head up, only to see a man in plate armor holding a boot to his shoulder. Bormask stood there. His namesake, the boar helmet was badly dented. Part of the mock boar's eye was caved in. His armor had been ripped asunder in many places, and even now, the man was bleeding. Planning an escape? Bormask questioned. You aren't why I'm stalking these streets. But the world must consider itself fortunate that I was watching. A tyrant such as you cannot escape judgment. Brim raised his hand up. He opened his mouth, but his tongue was dry, and he could form no words. Bormask raised his mace up. Light fell onto his helmet revealing a blue eye as cold as the deep sea. Reap the misery you have sown. Bormask's mace descended. After a second, the man pulled away his foot and mace both. Gods above, nurture these souls I send to you, wicked though they may be. Bormask prayed as he cleaned his mace. There is one more I must send to meet you. I beg of you, watch over me, and ensure I walk the righteous path. Bormask limped into the alleyway, where Titus's voice grew ever louder. Hash. Now that Titus had brought his plan into light, Many of the oddities and inconsistencies throughout their journey started to make sense to Argrave. Regarding the weaponry. The only place where that many elven war relics could be found was in Malgeridum, deep within a cordoned section of the mines. Titus presumably found them there. The revolt was likely a distraction to move them, and it would explain why Annalise noticed Titus was nervous and anticipatory. His strange, uncertain allegiance started to make sense, if only just, since he knew much about Durin and the tribals. He had likely been the intermediary between them and Brium. He was near certainly the Lord of Copper's primary agent in this coup, influencing guards and population alike. The mystery remaining, though, was how this dire merchant had grown to this position of prominence. Was it a variation between fiction and reality? Was it a set of coincidences, one after another? Had Argrave brought this about by changing things? Or were powers beyond Argrave's can influencing matters? Argrave stepped into the square where the victors gathered, listening to Titus. Blue eels sparked and swirled around him dramatically. His brimusness flanked him filling the air with their mysterious fog as they sung their chiming song. Following behind was Annalise, Gulliman, the Southron elves. Everyone noticed their presence, flashing lights and growing mists were eye-catching, after all. If they wanted to be heard in a large crowd, they must be seen, and Argrave made damn sure they'd be seen. Annalise held her hand up and cast, sky sunder, the loudest spell that they knew. It achieved the same effect as Titus spell, everyone focused on them. Argrave spread his arms out and shouted, People of Sethia, people of the tribes, all of the lords of this city are dead and gone. The Lord of Gold, slain by her own people, the Lord of Silver, felled by my hand. Argrave revealed the Silver Inheritance Medallion, it was a ceremonial thing, and so easily recognizable. And lastly, the Lord of Copper, slain by the heroic elves of the Burnt Desert. The crowd greeted this with enthusiasm, it was the sort of friendly welcome Argrave hoped to receive, that they might be more receptive to further direction. Durin turned his gaze towards them, too and urged his wyvern to rest not too far from them. Despite what Titus claims, the Southron elves did not provide Durin with any weaponry whatsoever. Argrave stepped forward, standing atop rubble to reach a higher place. I brought the elves into this struggle for independence, no one else. Argrave waved Florimond up to where he stood. It's true, Florimond added as he came to join them. We provided no weaponry to the people here. We were aware of the coming battle only days ago. There was no time to distribute weapons to anyone. He's covering for them. A member of the crowd shouted. The elves need the tribal's protection. Do a people who would confront the Lord of Copper alone seem the type to scrape and bow for the sake of protection? Argrave countered quickly, anticipating Titus' men might try and sabotage things. No. They seek peace, not protection. I can attest to the Southron elves' innocence in this matter. Yet how can any trust Durin? Titus shouted out. The tribals know he was the one to discover the Southron elves. 
Despite what this foreigner claims, he discredits me by naming me foreigner, Argrave deduced quickly. If none know of this collaboration besides the tribals, then how do you? Argrave questioned. Where is your proof? Because I was once a tribal, Titus replied quickly. And I still have friends there. Bellard, the man who'd spoken against the elves earlier rose, almost in queue. I, Titus has kept in contact with us. He suffered underneath the reign of the vessels, fighting for independence from within. Then it seems just as likely that he is the one who armed men with elven war relics as Drun. Argrave suggested at once. A few voices rose up, booing, and the power of the few bought voices within a crowd made itself known. A mob was a volatile thing. Humans are reasonable creatures, by and large, but within a crowd, one can project their opinion infinitely. People join in protest simply to be a part of the group. Self-awareness and personal identity are muted in a mob, and reactions trend towards the emotional side of reasoning. The large majority of the people likely did not know who Titus even was, but the crowd soon joined in expressing their disdain for our grave's accusation. Titus rang his bell and made to speak, but our grave sees the opportunity. I accuse no one. Argrave explained. There is simply no proof in this matter. A proper judgment cannot be made. And why not? Another voice chimed in. Bormask appeared on a roof, holding a man by the neck. I captured this man. He had ease, he explained, holding out arrows that had purple runes etched into the arrowheads. How did you get these? Bormask demanded of the man, shaking him about. Argrave nodded at the unexpected contribution. Titus. Titus men gave them to us, gave us all our plans. The man shouted, choking from Bormask's grip. Those words could not be booed but a silence did take over the crowd. The man's been badly beaten. He'd say anything. Titus refuted, and his men planted in the crowd joined in support. Argrave. Glimmon muttered, stepping up to him. Titus' archers are getting twitchy. Argrave nodded, feeling a sense of nervousness. What's more, Titus continued. Darren, son of the current chief, led his people into war against his father's wishes. He pointed to Darren, still mounted atop his wyvern. Your father said he would exile you if you went through with this. Argrave's heart froze. In the game, Durin could reconcile with his father and earn his support if the player took certain actions. He didn't know if the Durin of this reality had. Though Argrave looked to Durin, hoping to all that was holy that wasn't true, he could glean nothing for the man wore a helmet. Argrave looked to Annalise. Titus isn't lying, she shook her head. He led men into war against the wishes of his dying father. Titus declared damningly, if that proves anything, it shows that Durin is one who would do anything to gain power. By giving elven war relics, ordering indiscriminate slaughter, he sought to weaken Sethia control it completely with his tribals. Dying father, Argrave noted, Durin's dad never, people. Titus shouted, stepping forth to the edge of the tower he stood atop. For centuries, the burnt desert has been trampled beneath the heel of tyrants. For the first time in ages, we have liberated this place from the cruel, from the unjust, from the wicked. Cheers began to swell, and Titus continued, in the distant past. The southern tribals waged war unending, with each other, with the north, with the south Ron elves. Titus spread his arms out and paced about, and after them came the vessels, tyrants of a different breed, religious fanatics fueled by zeal and following cold laws of an ancient god. We have suffered beneath them, all of us. They took the very water from the earth, the very blood from our veins, our souls from our bodies. My own wife, my children, both drained by the vessels. Our grave sought desperately for a point to interject, feeling the crowd slowly slipping away into Titus' narrative. His words seemed ironclad, though and Argrave did not dare force his way into things lest he draw yet more ire. In Delphasium, our people labor for hours unending, tending to fields and feeding grapes to their overlords. Titus pointed north. In Malgeridum, the vessels prostitute our women to the rich, while the men work in the mines, breathing metal and fire day in and day out to be rewarded with only food and drink. Titus pointed east. In Garlandian, people toil away, crafting fineries and papyrus that the vessels use wastefully. Tyrants all, untenable, intolerable. Unjust. Titus paused to take a great breath. This land, this great land, with its stark beauty, does not need to be ruled by those past. He stepped to the edge. We cannot allow a man like Darren, a man who would do anything to gain power, to once again lead us towards death and misery. We need a nation to mend the wounds caused by despots. We have that opportunity. Let us go forth into a new age, embracing change, embracing unity between the southern tribals, the south Ron elves and all the people of this vast desert, with that, Titus turned and rang the bell, perhaps he did not need to, though, the great ringing was completely muffled by the deafening cheers that erupted following Titus' speech, Argrave could feel their voices shake the air, almost, his archers are all but ready to fire, Glimmon said loudly in Argrave's ear, Argrave nodded, it was a game of chicken, now, Titus had no plans to back down, Argrave could tell that the man was willing to do anything to achieve the future he envisioned, that impression was drilled into the crowd's bones just as well as Argrave's, an incredibly loud noise split the air, sending the mist spawned by the Brumisners dancing away in a whirl, Durin's wyvern roared, head held high, maintaining its volume for nearly ten seconds, people stumbled over themselves, 
afraid, and many readied to fight. Darren walked atop his wyvern's snout and removed his wyvern scale helmet. Let this tyrant speak, he said, wrath in his voice. Chapter 142, Left Wanting. You, growled Darren. All of you, before the battle is even finished, you devolve into base vultures. You pick at a carcass still warm, still pumping blood. He looked about the crowd. You paint me as a monster with the direction of some snake merchant, who puts forth his own claim to the city in the same breath. The people beneath Titus rose their voices, but Doran raised his own volume, drowning them out. I thought to help people. The purest motivation, devoid of politics, of ambition. I left the tribes, saw the people of Sethia suffering. And I knew that something had to be done, even if it cost me my future in the tribe. Doran spread his arms out, and his wyvern rose him up higher. It seems, though, that good intentions are always marred by opportunists. I should have known better. So go forth, Doran continued, waving his hands dismissively. Go into your new age striving for a better future, led by men like Titus who butcher your brothers and sisters to frame another. I'll have no part of this anymore, even if you beg. But I won't stand here and let anyone accuse me of wrongdoing, Durin. Bormask called out. Forget it, Durin shook his head. Titus, if there's one thing we agree on, it's that my people offer no future for the desert. But you, you are no different than the brand back buried in the sand, luring people in with promise of an oasis only to swallow them whole. I won't endanger myself to save fools, not any longer. Durin strode down the back of his wyvern's neck. People shouted at him and threw things. Titus made a hand signal, and Gilliman tensed, grasping Argrave's shoulder to remind him of the archers. Argrave knew that Titus, ruthless as he was, wouldn't remain content in allowing his largest opponent to simply walk away. Thinking desperately, Argrave willed the electric heels he'd summoned earlier away from his person until they hovered above the belt out Titus stood atop. It was a conspicuous move, but Argrave felt no other option. Darren, Argrave called out, voice tight. One of the men with me is injured, Quentin. I think I'll need you to give them a ride. For safety, he alluded. Argrave pointed to the roofs where the archers watched, and Darren, with a higher vantage point, spotted them and caught on quickly. Fine, he said acting bitter, hurry things along. If I see these snakes any longer, I might vomit. Argrave locked eyes with Titus. The two held their gaze for a long while. Argrave spread his arms out, letting the electric heels dance a little faster. Eventually, the dye merchant lowered his hands, and Gilliman's dense grip slackened. The archers soon slid down the roof quietly and jumped off. Argrave called back his eels, though kept Titus' position in mind. Dot the bodies, Florimon spoke up. They need to be delivered home. I don't wish to leave them in the open sun. Quentin, you should go with. I'll stay. I need to speak for my people, should the need rise. I can bring the bodies, Durin said, gazed distant, but not much else. We can walk back to Otrukshire, Argrave suggested. Sorry to impose, Darren, but can you help them out? Might not be welcome home anymore, Durin noted, keeping his wife and steady as he stared out across the crowd with cold eyes. Otrukshire is as fine a place to go as any. Durin stopped scanning the crowd, setting his eyes on Bormask. And what will you do? My business here is not yet done, Bormask said simply. But I won't act rashly. Not yet. I refuse to make things worse. So go, Darren, Argrave. The Masked Knight looked to him as he mentioned his name. You rather resemble your brother. Though much skinnier, the Masked Knight noted. Argrave didn't know how to respond to that for a time, but eventually he managed, hopefully a lot less heartless. I don't know. Bormask shook his head. Time will make that clear. That's true, Rolf. Argrave said the man's real name, then walked away, content to leave him unsettled. As Argrave left, Bormask never tore his gaze away from his departure, stunned. Hash. Now you see the merit of your help, Garm noted as they walked across the warm sand. You leave hated, unwanted. You extend your hand only to have it bitten. If people find you have a heart of gold, they won't admire it. They'll mine it until every vein of gold is dry, leaving you only with a withered husk of stone. Argrave drawed up the dunes silently turning to look back at Sethia. The place was badly flooded and largely ruined. Gleman walked with them, unfocused, while Annalise led them, her expression indiscernible. You sure know how to cheer everyone up, Garm. Argrave finally responded, voice and gaze both distant. He thought back to the battle against the Lord of Silver. How's your soul, my soul? Garm repeated, confused. Spare me the act. Argrave turned from Sethia, facing the head atop Gleman's backpack. You used, voice of the corrupt, barring the fact that Sabi ranks spell you supposedly can't cast. I know you haven't done any soul harvesting recently, so you must have used a piece of your own. Gleman devoted his attention to the conversation, while Garm's black and gold eyes stayed fixed on Argrave. The proof, Garm finally said. Argrave raised a brow in the silence that followed. You've given plenty proof. About Gerektig Kiet. What are you, exactly? Garm asked. The things you know. I have no choice but to acknowledge it. You're not an extrasensory of some kind. It seems you have a base of knowledge to fall back on. What is it? Argrave said nothing thinking of how to answer this. Garm continued his inquiries. You mentioned avatars. And other strange, 
convoluted things. Are you the hand of some god, a prophet? I certainly don't see you kneel and pray at any time, so it's doubtful. You're willing to admit, then, that I'm telling the truth? Argrave stepped a little closer. Garm's eyes followed Argrave. My soul. Yes, I used some of my soul. Much of it was to save myself. I die with you, in case you forget. I asked that question a minute ago, and you answer it now? Argrave shook his head. I'm making a point. It's an analogy. Garm closed his eyes for a moment. When they opened once more, they seemed fiercer, somehow. I'm a walking. Damn, he trailed off, recognizing he used the wrong word. I embody a contradiction. Embody, Argrave repeated. Even that word is a bit ill-fit. You think I'm not aware I live only because of your party's generosity? Garm interrupted, voice cold. My existence can only be sustained by selflessness, yet I preach constantly about the virtue of self-importance. We brokered an agreement, Annalise said. The others agreed. It, a deal maintained only because you people are stupid enough to keep your word, Garm butted in once more, then laughed. It was a bitter, slow chuckle, that slowly trailed off. I always found the Vedaman foreign. A people who value contracts, honor, loyalty above even their own life. It seemed ridiculous. Yet here we are, excluding one notable exception that happened today. My presence has only hindered you. Still, you keep me around. Argrave crossed his arms. Yeah, we keep you around. You think we shouldn't? I don't know as much as I want, but even the Order of the Rose wasn't this. Absolutist, shall we say, about these things. Garm lowered his gaze to the sand below. It's a personal philosophy, not a cultural one. I'll spare you my tale of woe. I don't care to relive it by telling it to others. He raised his gaze back to Argrave. But every time I tried to be generous, I was disappointed. He laughed through his nose, then added, even landing as I am. The man who made me this way, I taught him. Ha. Garm laughed as though it was the funniest thing in the world, repeating the line, I taught him. I helped him devise the theory that makes you three drag me about as the burden I am. I was on a selfish streak until that point, but then I decided to be golden-hearted once again. Look at me now. You're alive, Argrave said simply. He isn't. Garm sighed. I know. Disappointing in some ways oddly comforting in others. But the point is this. Garm's brows furrowed. It's hard for me to muster the will to do something that doesn't benefit me. Not after what I've been through. But. Annalise prompted him, catching he had more to say. But that boy, Darren, Garm began. He reminds me of myself. Same sense of humor. And he projects that very same disappointment I feel. That. Coupled with how you fools have treated me. I don't know. The trailed off, taking a pause to regather his thoughts. All I can do is think. I'm more brain than skin. And I've been doing much thinking. Garm's gaze jumped between the three of them. I'd like to ask a favor. I want to talk to Drun. You said a while ago you want him as an ally. Maybe I can make that happen. Almost. Like confronting myself, in a manner of speaking. But. And though I loathe to say it. If you can give me this last bit of proof. If you can become black-blooded as you claim. I'll help you. All of you. No more holding back. I'll cooperate. Fully. Argrave smiled. It felt like the first time he'd done that today. I'm happy to hear it. Don't act like it's earth-shattering, Garm cautioned. We've established I'm a burden who can offer very little genuine help. My magic takes months to replenish. That one spell I used set me back immeasurably. Annalise raised her hand to draw attention. Darren may not be as you think, though. His anger is not genuinely towards the people, I believe. It is towards himself. His own weakness. His own inability. Garm smiled knowingly. All the more reason, then. Hash. Glimmon held his gauntlet in hand sitting atop a rock. His arm had been cleanly severed. Destroying the armor with it, it had been a difficult task to remove the flesh from the metal, but now that it was free, he could not reconnect it with the rest of his armor. It was yet another thing he needed a smith for. They were in the oasis town of Otrickshire. Argrave spoke with Durin and the Southron elves, he'd practically ordered Gilliman to rest. Perhaps in an attempt to allow the vampire to regain his focus, put his self-loathing to bed. Gilliman, Annalise interrupted, and the vampire raised his head up quickly surprised. I have never come this close without you noticing before. You are very disturbed. Glimmon said nothing. Do you know? She began, stepping closer. I am the reason those slaves in Argent are dead. Glimmon frowned at once. Don't comfort me with pedantry. Regardless of any mistake you might have, come to think of it, so is our grave and calm. She knelt down, staring at him. We were aware of your vampirism. Aware you are a hungry, bloodthirsty fiend. Yet we travel with you. We refrained from killing you. He stared at her. His expression still fierce. You see how ridiculous that sounds, no? Annalise said flatly. I know you will piece yourself together, given time. But I simply wish to contribute that to your thoughts. Everyone, it seems, is blaming themselves. Darren blames himself. Argrave blames himself. Even me. Everyone feels responsible for misery around them. Like. We failed. We were found lacking. Glimmon dropped the gauntlet he held. I. Understand your point. He finally said, Argrave relies on you. Seeing you like this makes him worry. And I do not like him to worry. That is all. She shrugged, then rose to her feet. Cold words, 
Gulliman shook his head, fine, never thought I'd be told to stop whining and suck it up, that's not, relax, Gulliman held a hand out, joking. He rose to his feet, standing with a straight back, let's go, then, nothing more needed to be said, by Gulliman's estimation. Chapter 143, Cushioned Iron Fist When you said you had something to show me. Duran trailed off, then looked to Argrave. This is one of the last things I expected. You're not a necromancer, no, Argrave shook his head. He is, though, and he wishes to speak with you. The Southron elves don't care much about necromancy, so fret not. Duran stared down at Garm, brows furrowed and eyes wide. Not ominous at all, he nodded his head slowly. Listen, I, you should listen, interjected Garm annoyedly. Argrave, let me speak to him alone. Argrave looked down at Garm. Sure about that? What if, if he ends me? Avenge me? Pretty please? Garm mocked. Just put me in the sand, walk away. The elves need to talk to you, that much I know. This one's too bothered to be of much help. I'll talk to him. Argrave shrugged, then planted Garm into the sand. All right, be gentle, Darren, he's more sensitive than he looks. He walked away in long strides, casting glances backward occasionally. I know this is bizarre, Garm began once Argrave was far away, but I don't want to be slowly introduced to you. I don't have the luxury of patience, grooming you to understand what I am. I need to speak. Now, this is some. Darren ran his fingers through his matted hair. What are you? Living misery. Garm introduced himself. And Garm, High Wizard of the Order of the Rose. Darren stared for a moment, then shook his head. This should mean something to me. Garm sighed. Foolish of me to think one secluded in the mountain would know of my order. It doesn't matter. I was once an A-rank mage. Still am, technically. But limited. As you can plainly see, Argrave has been accommodating me the past month. Darren shifted on his feet. All right. Still not getting the full picture, but... You're a powerful spellcaster. You were a powerful spellcaster, he amended. Still don't see why we should be speaking. Still don't know how you speak, he added, obviously disturbed as he gazed at the stake protruding downwards from his neck. I'm speaking to you because we're alike, and we've gone through similar things. Garm paused, then lowered his voice. Gulliman, the big one, how near is he? Durant said nothing, very suspicious. Eventually, he scanned the distance, then said, pretty far. How far? Insisted Garm in a whisper. One. Two hundred feet. I guess, it should be fine, then, but keep your voice down, that one hears all, and I won't draw suspicion by conjuring a ward. Garm cleared his throat, an action that disturbed Duran, and then continued, you, I can practically smell it on you, the frustration with other people, the frustration with yourself, your weakness, your ineffectual leadership, are you about to tell me not to feel this way, a head on a stick comes to cheer me up, because we're similar? Duran laughed, what is this, a joke, comedy can't solve all woes, if this is what you're getting at, but you're also pragmatic. Garm continued in a low mutter, and after that little awakening back at Sethia, doubtless you're feeling a bit disillusioned. You're realizing how stupid the average person is. Durant stared down at Garm, silenced by his words. You're right to think that. People can be stupid, provided they're leaded poorly, Garm stated matter-of-factly. But you. You're weak. Nothing. No more than dirt. Unable to enact meaningful change. You need power to save people from their own stupid decisions. Power the world has proven you lack in totality. Durin's golden eyes gained back some of their fire as he stared down at Garm. In totality, you're taking the putt down a bit far, Totem Pole. Do you know why it is I traveled with the three of them? Garm questioned. I needed options. I needed a way to earn a new body. But things can change. The wind can shift. Sensible goal, I guess. Durin stared down at Garm cautiously. Can't you imagine life as easy for you as you are now? It's misery, as I said earlier. Garm confirmed. I need a change, first. Ever had sleep paralysis? It's a terrifying thing, and that terrifying thing is my entire life. I feel like I'm losing my mind every day. And now, my soul is damaged. You probably don't understand the meaning of that, but it is. The head struggled for the words. It's bad for the mind, to say the least. Is it my turn to comfort you? Duran questioned. Garm sighed. You are just like me. Damned smart us. No wonder people hate me. Hate? Women love me, I'll have you know. Duran quipped, love you for a week or two, maybe more, till they realize they've made a mistake, I've had my fun in the sun, believe me, you can't fool me, Garm answered, undaunted, you can see why that might be hard for me, now, we can agree on that, at least, Duran nodded slowly, we'll agree on more, if I've read you right, I know I have, you're weak, you resent this, you're proud of being talented, of being handsome, of being superior, not for vanity, but because you believe that you can handle the future best because of it, Duran didn't answer, but his pupils shook as if he'd heard a sentence he'd been thinking for years. Imagine lacking arms, legs, even a torso. Lacking independence. Garm stared up, unblinking. I know you don't pity me. I wouldn't. But I, I know power. I know power better than any of the people you've seen today. Any you've seen die today. Priam, Quarus, the Golden One. Forget her name. In my prime, they were nothing to me. Seems that worked out well for you, 
Doran interjected. Garm blatantly ignored him. We're on a limited time frame, so I'll speak my offer plainly. You'll help me. Quietly. Argrave, Gilliman, Annalise, even your lizard pet, you'll tell no one of our arrangement, and, in return, I'll make you no power, too. Power beyond your conception. Pretty sure it's a universally bad idea to accept a bargain with a head on a stake, Doran pointed out. Garm smiled. Maybe so, but time is running out fast. Soon, Argrave will become black-blooded. The damn boy is so confident, it'd be more surprising if he was lying. He's under the impression he's the only one that knows this alchemist, but the Order of the Rose knew of him, too. You're going to follow along, he wants you as an ally, and it should be simple enough. Garm's smile slowly dropped. They won't want this. I don't plan on giving them a choice, though. I've been waiting too long for one bit of freedom. Darren furrowed his brows, then finally whispered, What exactly is it you want? Hash. Florimond returned to Otrickshire at night. Argrave was ready to receive him. The other Southron elves tended to the bodies that Duran had brought back. Argrave certainly wasn't going to sleep. The elves of the village treated Argrave strangely, treated him as simultaneously a guest and a danger. He supposed it was respect. He wasn't used to that. The leader of the old veterans didn't give news. First, instead, Florimond asked Argrave, their bodies, they made it safely? Uh, yeah, Argrave confirmed. They haven't been buried. I'll do that tonight. Florimond shook his head his large ears swaying with the movement. Maybe you should rest first, Argrave suggested. Well, not my place to give you advice. What happened at Asethia? Hated to leave like that, but it's clear it wasn't exactly safe. Titus is already the de facto leader. Florimond shook his head. He took control quickly. But, well, it did not feel like an arm takeover. He had medical needs tended to, food distributed, water collected, shelters established. Florimond retrieved something, and he gave me this, instructed me to bring it to my people. Argrave looked down. Light was dim, but he recognized it was paper. You've read it? Argrave questioned, looking up. It's a proposal to us. A pact of non-aggression, mutual defense, and promises of supplement, aid, cooperation. Permits free entry into Sethia, gives exemptions from tolls and taxes, priority in trade, all of it, free, and for the Southron elves alone. That's... Argrave trailed off. It sounds like a very good thing. And that might be the problem. A honeyed apple hides poison all the better. It asks nothing of you. There are some things. Florimond nodded, unrolling the paper. Argrave conjured light, scanning the document quickly. The ink was old and dry, suggesting the document had been drafted some time ago. We have to recognize Sathia as independent. Support Titus as its leader. And agree to use their soon-to-be-minted coins in all of our dealings. Mutual defense, too, might be considered a condition. Argrave soon confirmed the things Florimond described with his own eyes as he read the paper. But he... Argrave hesitated to argue against the document. This was regarding the Southron elves' future. What place did he have to argue? I know what you think, Florimond nodded. This is a man willing to butcher innocents to gain this power. He tried to frame one of his allies when it was politically expedient. Florimond stepped away. I cannot make the decisions for my people, though. I will tell them everything. Believe me, I am as wary of Titus as you are. Argrave rolled up the paper and held it back out to Florimond. Don't forget he was ready to kill more people had I not threatened him personally. But he does not demand fealty, Florimond noted, taking the paper. Instead, he suggests cooperation. He seemed amenable to negotiations, too, if we were unsatisfied with the proposal. The elf held the paper close to his face. We are isolated, protected. With the vessels gone from Sethia, we are the safest we've been in decades. I see no reason we cannot probe. Figure out whether or not he can be trusted. If that's your decision, Argrave said cautiously. Regardless, I am eternally grateful for your help. What you've done. What you lost, Argrave noted, looking away where he knew the bodies of the veterans lie. You have my condolences. Morven would tell you to shove your condolences. Florimon lowered his head, then laughed. They were glad to be sacrificed. They fought for hope. Hope. For the first time in a while, I have some. Our future might not be so bleak. Florimon looked at the paper. But maybe I'm an old man fooled by a snake merchant. Be careful, Argrave warned. Titus, I wish I knew more about him. I wish I could give you better advice than that. You might try asking Duran. You can't be expected to know everything, everyone. Florimond stepped up to Argrave, looking upwards into his eyes. Did you get what you needed at Adjunt? I did, Argrave nodded. Then what is next for you? My people made promises to you, they remain valid. I'll leave early dawn. Argrave looked to the sky, should reach where I need to be in a day. There. Argrave took a deep breath and exhaled as what was coming slowly set in, going to get some cosmetic surgery, change my blood from red to black, once that's done, I'll come back here, call in that promise, Argrave shrugged, though, with the war relics you gave us, feels like I'm asking too much, cosmetic surgery, are you joking, Argrave lowered his head, well, it's not cosmetic, Florimond snorted, you're the sort that likes to be mysterious, I see, I'm caught, Argrave smiled, you should sleep, 
Floraman suggested. Our homes are open to you. Our grave looked away. Can't sleep. Won't bother trying. New to bloodshed? Floraman questioned. No. Not that. Our grave shook his head. Sad as it is. Gotten a little used to blood. Guilt. Then, Floraman concluded. Our grave frowned. How do you know? It's obvious. Floraman nodded. You have the guilt of a leader. You feel that the plans you made are insufficient. All the suffering, it's on your hands. A bit true. Our grave closed his eyes. If I had been smarter, better, pointless questions, Floramond pushed our grave lightly. Reflect on mistakes, correct them. Ruin your inability is a useless thing. Our grave digested the words, then laughed with a shake of his head. I think Gilliman said something like that, in the past, because he was a leader once, too. Floramond pushed our grave's shoulder once again. I've said enough. I must bury those I lost. Our grave nodded, as Floramond left. He called out, Thank you. Floramond, for everything. Chapter 144, Ride and Die. You want to give us a ride? Argrave questioned Duran. I do, Duran nodded, spinning his wyvern scale helmet about in his hands. Up close, the armor was quite impressive, a coat of grey lamella wyvern scales stretching down to the knees, held together with studs of what looked to be brass. His glaive was made of wyvern bone. It was done in the style of the Southron elves. All in all, impressively armed. Argrave crossed his arms. Why? You probably saved me from Titus? Duran answered at once. I owe you a debt. I'd expect you to default on the first payment of any debt you got. Argrave shook his head. And it's not probably. I did save you from Titus. Duran laughed. You act like you know so much about me. It's a bit perplexing. Argrave stared at Duran. The man was obviously in better spirits. He couldn't help but spare a glance at Garm. I know an uncomfortable amount about you. Argrave nodded. Your favorite color is gray. Particularly when supported with burgundy. Maybe that's why I'm coming, Duran suggested. Because your favorite color? No. Because you know so much about me, Duran interrupted. There is something I don't know, Argrave confessed. Your father. You said he was dying? Well, he improved in time to dish out some spiteful, life-ruining nonsense. But yeah, Duran nodded. Argrave looked to Annalise, and she nodded, confirming he was being honest. Argrave turned away. Did he just catch an illness randomly? It's certainly possible. But it could be foul play, too. Argrave juggled the idea, but then realized, does it really matter? Now, how in the world do you know so much about me while being ignorant of common knowledge within the tribe? Duran stepped forth back into Argrave's sight. For reasons you couldn't comprehend or codify, Argrave snapped back to attention. Listen. The place we're going is very out of the way. That's fine. It'll be nice to have a last long voyage with my girl. Duran looked to where his wife and was. Some of the Southron elf children played with the creature cautiously. She isn't mine. She's the tribe's. She'll go back to the tribe when I set her loose. She's still young and she needs to have children. Not many females left living after the battle. Finders, keepers, maybe? Argrave suggested. Duran was confused for a second, but he placed the meaning after a time and laughed lightly. She's a social one. She won't last long away from the others. Argrave sighed. Maybe you can get another, then? Bring it too. I'll take it. That'd be a sight. Watching you try and fly, Duran turned his head back. But you still never answered me. Argrave looked over to Garm. Ought to have him talk to people more. He noted, happy to accept free transportation, I'll need to get things together, secure them on the back of your wyvern. Then we can get going, hash. Durin's wyvern hovered above endless blackness. They were only a few hours past sunrise, and the suns had not yet come over some distant mountains, keeping the black desert illuminated only by the pale blue light of dawn. Even if the place had been better illuminated, the only thing they'd be able to see better would be the eternal black dunes of sand. Not a bit of civilization could be seen in any direction. Even from their significant height, to be lost in this place was a death sentence, it seemed, nothing lived here. Even the brandbacks, titanic predators, did not lure prey in this place. You sure you aren't taking me somewhere secluded to do me in? Duran shouted over the winds. Given how many people hate you now, I don't think seclusion would be necessary. Argrave returned. The great wyvern continued to glide onwards, Argrave confidently directing Duran where he knew to go. He used the mountains and the compass as his guide. Beside him, he saw Annalise struggling with her hair. One of her braids had come loose, and strands of hair battered about everywhere. Argrave leaned in, shielding her from the wind, giving her time sufficient to correct the issue. Thanks, she said. Perhaps I should cut it. Given how much we travel, it only causes problems. That would be a tragedy, Argrave stated. It looks too good to cut, though. Your choice, naturally. Annalise tilted her head but said nothing in response. Argrave turned his attention back towards the dunes of sand. Now that they approached Argrave's final goal, he finally felt the nervousness set in. He had been obsessively checking everything to be sure that nothing was amiss. The wraith's heart was fine, the amaranthine heart still functioned, the unsullied knife still retained its power, and the crimson wellspring had not a single crack. Still, becoming black-blooded as our grave had a thousand times more weight than it had in Heroes of Berenda. Failure and success both promised to be monumentally emotional things. If our grave failed, 
Now, to say the least, the prospect made falling off this wyvern and seem not so bad. But Argrave was not worried about failure. The alchemist might be temperamental. But he would be as eager to perform this surgery as Argrave would be to receive it. Such was his nature. Argrave was more worried about whether or not his companions would get through this unscathed. Argrave spotted the shift in the constant sand dunes and tapped Durin's shoulder. There. He pointed. Where the color changes. The lighter shades of black? Durin questioned, and Argrave nodded. No, those are just quicksand pits. Must be somewhere else. That's the spot. Darren, Argrave insisted. Darren turned his head back, staring Argrave down, but then eventually swallowed and nodded. As they neared the pits of quicksand, the wyvern started to slowly descend it, spurred downwards by its rider. They circled round, and Darren eventually landed atop a dune of sand a fair distance away. The landing scattered sand everywhere. Phew, Argrave breathed out, then stepped off the wyverns. His legs, weak from the ride, collapsed beneath him, and he slid down the dune a bit in a sitting position. His brimasoners abandoned him immediately jumping to safety. Once our grave came to a stop, he overlooked a vast plain of deadly quicksand. Well, somewhat deadly quicksand. As long as one wasn't stupid, they could easily get out, even if they landed in the center of one of the pits. It wasn't meant to catch humans, it was meant for animals. Indeed, meant. They'd been constructed here, not formed naturally. Our grave's sinners came to his side, their golden eyes glowing. Apparently, they had much to eat here, plenty of souls drifting about, ready for feasting. Annalise stepped up to our grave her own fox held in her hands. It quickly jumped down from her arms and watched the pits ahead, eating souls in silence with its kin. Desolate, Annalise noted. Depressing, Glimmon confirmed. Dastardly, Argrave finished the alliteration with an ill-fitting word, then sighed. Now I'm thinking about Brian, that poet creep. This is the treacherous path you mentioned? Darren walked up, too, still holding his wyvern's reins as he walked. Hope there's something I'm missing. Nope. Pick a hole. Any hole. Actually, that hole, specifically. Argrave pointed one out. I've taken this path too many times to forget it. You want us to jump into quicksand? Darren frowned. Us? Argrave repeated. I thought you wanted to give a ride, nothing more. I still want answers. Darren shook his head. If I have to tag along until I get them, so be it. Argrave frowned, suspicious of that answer. Darren was whimsical, but not to this degree. He had a purpose, certainly. He wondered what Garm had said to the man. It had to be something related to that. Argrave wished to simply ask. But he feared he might make Garm feel distrusted when things seemed to be improving. Still, Argrave knew he didn't have the luxury to relax his vigilance, especially not when he was at the cusp of becoming black-blooded. Argrave liked Adrian. He wouldn't mind having him tag along, temporarily or permanently. He was talented, diligent. But his loyalty was untested. I'll have a word with Annalise and Gilliman, have them keep a closer eye on Adrian. He decided with some measure of guilt. He felt paranoid. He wasn't about to let guilt ruin months of blood, sweat, and tears, though. He wanted to trust Garm but their own experience had proven he was capable of deception. Darren was no saint, either. Well, I don't exactly loathe your presence. If you wish to follow, follow. Argrave rose to his feet with a grunt. But maybe I'm just a madman about to jump into quicksand. Ought to consider that. Some say genius and insanity are two sides of the same coin, Garm commented. Fortunately, you're none too genius, and by the law of inverse, I'd say we're safe. I see Garm has volunteered to enter first. Argrave said with a bitter smile as he walked back up to the wyvern. As Argrave tussled with his backpack, unstrapping it from the wyvern's back, Durin walked up to Argrave. Hold on a minute, Durin said cautiously. You're just going to jump in? I mean, the thing probably isn't deep enough to even take you. You'll just get stuck. What is it you're expecting to happen? There's a path below, Argrave explained. A path, Durin repeated. Yeah, Argrave nodded, then pulled his backpack free. He put it around his shoulders. Annalise and Gilliman moved to do the same retrieving Garm and their own luggage. All right, all right, Durin nodded. All right, I've got some rope. We can make a stake, stick it into the sand. Should be enough to pull us out, in case things go awry. He mused, planning. You can if you want, Argrave nodded. But if you take too long, I won't be able to guide you. Place isn't exactly intuitive, though, I warn you. Durin frowned. What do you mean, not intuitive? Well, Argrave began, then waved his hand. All these questions, he complained. You talk more than me. Durin held his hands out offended. She asks innumerable questions. You don't seem to have a problem with that. He gestured to Annalise. She's an exception. Argrave shook his head, then walked down towards the quicksand. When he reached the pit he'd pointed to earlier, his step didn't even slow before he plunged his foot in, wading deeper. Already, he sunk. His two companions were just as unhesitating in entering after him. Even their pets, the light grey creatures resembling fennec foxes, clung to them as they sunk. Gods above, muttered Drun. He was stunned for a minute, then he started to laugh. Never thought I'd see the day someone made me look reasonable. He removed the reins from his wyvern and cast them to the ground. He removed the saddle, too, and threw it aside. Live well, girl. Hope my people treat you better than they did me. 
he said as he put his head to its face. With a deep breath to gather courage, he turned. Our grave was already leg deep into the pit. Darren took slow, steady steps towards the pit. If it were a normal pit, he suspected they'd already have stopped sinking by now. Instead, they kept drifting lower. You coming? Our grave called out, chest covered. Water's nice and warm. You have no idea how much I wanted to pass, Darren shook his head but eventually stepped out. Argrave lifted his head up as the pit covered his neck. Joke's on you. This was all an elaborate murder-suicide. He left those words before he inhaled, filling his lungs. Darren stared as Argrave's face vanished. He started to laugh once more. This guy. Darren muttered as he watched his body sink ever lower. Eventually, the pressure around his feet lessened. He could move his feet freely, he found. Despite that assurance, he couldn't hold back the fear from the uncertainty. His wife and moved closer to the quicksand pit, watching Durin disappear. As his face vanished, Durin heard the roar of his wife and, maybe it thought he'd died. Durin was half convinced he did. Eventually, though, he kept descending, and dropped down. Durin landed on his feet. He was surrounded by darkness. A light soon filled the room. They seemed to be encased in a cube of obsidian. On each side of the room, there was a portal containing a mass of moving sand, instead of downwards, though. It flowed sideways. I'm really wondering what Garm told you that you genuinely follow. Argrave spoke to Duran. What is this place? Duran looked around, awed. A path. Argrave repeated his earlier claim. What? That's not obvious. He said drolly with a smile on his face, then lowered his gaze to his compass. All right. Follow me. People. Chapter 145. The Alchemist. Keep watch on Duran. Argrave spoke to Annalise and Gilliman. I told you before he'd be a good ally, but... He's volunteering to carry Garm. He's following us without reason. My scheme senses are tingling. I was going to tell you. Annalise nodded. I picked up the same. Though without scheme senses, granted. She noted with an amused smile. For what it is worth, I feel no malice from either. Argrave nodded. Reassuring. But you don't need to feel ill will to put someone six feet under. Just an abundance of ambition. I'd say the two of them could qualify. Argrave put his hand to his chin. Maybe they're trying to probe for information. Get the truth out of me. But damn. Whatever happened to asking questions? I'll take the rear, then, Glamon raised his hand. Right. Thanks, Argrave nodded. Just then, Darren emerged from the portal of sand just beside them, holding Garm in his hand upright. The other hand held his clay eye. He used it as a walking stick, somewhat. Took you long enough, Argrave greeted. Why in the world did you send me off alone in this scary place? Darren complained. Here. Don't know what this is, but I got it. Argrave received what Darren held out. It was a strange obsidian idol. It deactivates some animated guards ahead. Argrave lied easily. He had just wanted some time alone to speak with Gilliman and Annalise. Unless you care to fight them. Darren was already looking around the new environment, barely heeding Argrave's admonishment. He supposed he could not blame the man. The place they were in was ridiculous. The room wound about in ways that seemed to be geometrically impossible. Pillars of flowing black sand rose into endless abysses. The pathway ahead, which resembled polished obsidian, curved up to the wall and then the ceiling further down the hallway. To reiterate, follow what I do absolutely, Argrave informed Duran, his voice being the only disturbance in the absolute silence of the strange dimension. Don't ever run or jump unless I tell you to. If both of your feet are in the air at the same time, it's over for you, most likely. Glamon might catch you. He'll be taking the rear, just in case. Duran watched everything like it was seconds away from jumping out and biting him. This place is no petty illusion, Garm noted. All around, I see it. Magic, twisting, writhing dancing. I can't even fathom its purpose, and its creator. Why was this built? Cool scenery, maybe, Argrave suggested, only half in jest. In the game, it had been only that, a neat, if simple, little puzzle to occupy the player's senses. In reality, who knew? The alchemist knew, Argrave was certain. But the alchemist wasn't exactly an open forum. Argrave and his two elven companions were not devoid of nerves, either. Argrave started to step down a pathway, trying to keep his breathing steady. He constantly repeated the advice he'd given Dren in his head as he started to walk along the wall. Transitioning from walking the floor to walking along the walls was a powerfully disrupting sensation. One's body was accustomed to certain constants, and yet now, before its eyes, these constants were broken. It wasn't like his feet were stuck to the ground, no, rather, gravity itself seemed to move with a path. It was no illusion, either. Gods above. Darren called out as Argrave walked further into the stretching hallway before them, though. The gods might not be above in a second, he mused as he followed, with Gilliman taking the back of the party just as he'd promised. The silence of the dimly illuminated black landscape was marred only by the sounds of their footsteps, Gilliman's metal boots, Annalise's and Argrave's leather, and Dren's wyvern scale boots each made distinctive sounds. Argrave was hyper-focusing on his steps to ensure that none would be misplaced, but he felt that focus was making him all the worse for wear. Argrave's bromosanas squirmed within his clothes, perhaps sensing his terror through the druidic bond. I'm on the floor right now. Argrave told himself. Nothing strange, 
just floor. Don't look at the weird sand pillars, just keep walking. Yet his own thoughts felt like dogs nipping at his heels, and Argrave started to talk toward them away. Darren, he called out. A question for you. Can it? Wait. The man answered from further back. Why are you really here? Argrave ignored, pressing onwards. To follow someone into something like this, it's not something you do for answers, especially not when you don't know the value of them. Darren didn't answer and the five of them walked through the ever-twisting hallway. Argrave was about to demand an answer when the southern tribal finally broke the silence. Garm told me a lot, about Gerektik Kiet, about why you're here, about what you've done. So let's not act like the how these things doesn't have value, Durin answered back. I'd have to be an imbecile to miss that there's something interesting going on with you. Considering I've been exiled, self-exiled, I guess, not like I have much better to do. It was Argrave's turn for the long silence, now. That answer gave him a lot to digest. Garm had divulged much to Durin. The extent of his knowledge of Argrave, basically. Which begged the question, what spurred you to spill your guts, Garm? What, you're mad at me now? The head answered at once, as I recall, just outside Sethia, you said you'd prefer to have Durin as an ally. I took a little initiative, what's the problem? The polished obsidian pathway opened up into a large square. As they stepped out into, the abyss seemed to extend in all directions. It seemed if one reached their hand out, eternal darkness would eat it. The pathway extended no further. And that's it? Argrave questioned. Stopping and staring Garm in the eye. Garm stared back. I know I kept something from you in the past. But I meant what I said. I will help you, all of you. Argrave held his gaze for a while longer, studying Garm's expression. His black and gold eyes did not waver as they stared back, studying him in kind. He tried to see beyond. But they were just A's, black and or number. He could not see the thoughts in his head. Not what I meant. Argrave finally shook his head, diverting the conversation. I mean... Did you tell him about the alchemist? That's another important bit. Told him a little. Not enough for your high standards of caution, I presume, Garm said with a smile. Let me explain. After we jump, Argrave looked upwards. He bent his knees downward, then jumped up, slightly rotating backwards as if doing a backflip. At once, true gravity seized him, or perhaps it wasn't true at all. He fell towards the abyss above. His stomach churned, and he felt like vomiting. He passed through the darkness, and landed on his feet, perfectly, though uneased. Argrave was surprised by how smooth and comfortable the landing had been. Durin came next, surprisingly, he landed on his knees. Glimmon was third. He'd rotated too far, and ungracefully collapsed on his back. He recovered quickly, standing before Argrave could offer help. Annalise was last. She landed on her feet, though not steadily enough. She fell backwards. Argrave supported her with his arm, keeping her from falling. He was flustered, but he said, careful now as he helped her regain her balance. How's that? Been working on the gallantry. She calmed herself from the frightful fall, then laughed once she processed what Argrave had said. With whom? She questioned. Argrave only smiled in response, then turned to examine the road ahead once he was content she was steady. The place before them made the dreary blackness they'd come from seem a lie. Though the path ahead was the same polished obsidian, a vast jungle of uncountable different colors lay before them. All manner of life sprung from every corner of the place, the ceiling, the floor the walls. It was only barely distinguishable they were in a cave. Should be safe, now, Argrave told everyone. But don't wander carefully. Annalise, Gilliman, you know what I'm about to say. But still, make sure you listen, just in case. Never seen anything like this. Duran said, awed. You'll get to know this jungle very well, Argrave assured. All of you will be staying here. There's wildlife enough to sustain you. I will be in a bed. But I envy you, honestly. But enough about that. I'm to meet the alchemist. Argrave looked back at Duran. Duran pointed ahead. One man made this place? I don't know. Argrave shook his head. But here's the thing, Duran. I know you like getting attention. But in front of the alchemist, you want to be the least interesting thing in the world. Argrave walked up closer until he loomed over the man. I expect you to stay outside. Do not talk to him. Do not enter his house. Even if he wanders outside, ask him nothing. If he talks to you, don't see why he would. Answer quickly, bluntly, and honestly. Be rude. Be mean. I don't care and he won't either. But be honest. Duran nodded hesitantly. I'm not fucking around here, Argrave insisted, pointing at Duran. He lend you. Garm was right about the fact that I want you as an ally, I won't deny that. It's the only reason I let you come this far, dubious as your motives are. If you want to live, heed these words like they're the word of every god you hold dear. Argrave pressed his finger against Duran's chest. Annalise and Gilliman will make sure that you don't step out of line, even if they have to break your legs. Live like the dead. Capsi? Argrave leaned down closer. Duran looked confused, so Argrave translated. Do you understand? I get it. Duran pushed Argrave's hand away. I'm serious. Argrave reiterated. I'm not saying this for my sake. I'll be fine if you mess around. You'll be paced if you mess around. All of you will stay far away. You intend to meet this alchemist alone? 
Annalise frowned. You didn't mention this. Argrave turned away from Duran. Better this way. Less contact. Get in. Get out. She shook her head. I want to come with you. Do my words mean nothing? Argrave asked, exasperated. I know you're serious. She insisted at once, stepping closer. And I know to listen to your words. But, no, Argrave put his foot down. You can come after the surgery, when I'm recovering. And when he isn't around. Annalise looked frustrated and concerned, but after a long time of silence, she surrendered with a nod that made Argrave feel bad. I'll be fine, Argrave assured. Hell, doing this alone will probably make it easier. He took a deep breath, then turned over to the vibrant jungle ahead. Right. Everything's already in my pack. At the most nervous he'd ever been, Argrave stepped away. Wait here. You can visit tomorrow, probably. This guy is quick if anything, Argrave waved. Everyone waved back. The sight made Argrave feel hesitant to leave, and so he quickly turned, walking down the obsidian path before him. The jungle ahead, with its constant noise, was just as bad as the unending silence of the distorted entryway. The sights before him were uncomfortably familiar. He'd come here time and time again. Usually, he was excited. This time, it felt like his task was so monumentally important. His excitement was buried beneath pressure. A castle of sleek, sterile obsidian came into view. The architecture was foreign, almost alien, angular where one wouldn't expect a castle to be, round where it ought to be angular. The door itself was round, almost as if bulging outwards, and stood over thirty feet tall. Argrave paused at the door, removed his backpack, and retrieved the things he needed. He gave his brimus and his commands with druidic magic, and they took their place. He scrutinized each in turn, the amarantine heart, the wraith's heart, the crimson wellspring, and the instrument of surgery, the unsullied knife. They were exactly as he remembered them, with them in hand. He pushed open the door. It took some effort, being as large as it was. Argrave didn't notice the room at all. The sole figure within dominated his sight. The alchemist was standing, back straight, waiting. He must have been twenty feet tall. His black hair was like silk, and it extended downwards, forming robes around his vaguely humanoid shape. His ivory face was flat and squat, lacking a nose or nostrils at all. While his eyes were grey, he held his hands before him, crossed over each other. The tips of his fingers were palms, each with five digits of their own. Argrave took a deep breath and exhaled. No pageantry, no babbling, Argrave, to the point, I want to trade. Argrave spoke loud and clear with a will tempered by the constant hardship he'd endured thus far. I'll instruct you on how to perform a surgery that allows you to replace a human's blood with magic blood. I will provide the materials for said surgery. I will also provide a knife that allows for painless alterations of all physical and mystical. In return, you will perform the surgery I teach you. On me. The alchemist closed his eyes, then opened his mouth. Where teeth and a tongue had once been, one giant grey eye watched Argrave. Its eyes, too, both contorted into mouths. The eye focused on Argrave. The alchemist's lips lowered, almost as if the eye was squinting, and he leaned in. After a long moment of observation, the process was reverted and his face returned to normal. Shut the door, he said, voice like splintering ice. Argrave nodded, saying nothing, then turned to pull the door shut. Chapter 146, Apathy. The alchemist living beneath the hot sands of the burnt desert was nowhere near as insignificant as his name implied. The master of this obsidian castle was not merely a practitioner of alchemy. He embodied it, literally. His body was alchemy manifest. The principle of alchemy, fantasy alchemy, at least, was that of exchange. The most famous example would be turning lead to gold. In Heroes of Berinder, alchemy was duly a process by which potions were created, and a magic of conversion. The alchemist had displayed these qualities when Argrave had entered. His eyes and teeth had receded back into his head, whereupon they were alchemized within his body to form a single giant eye that better scrutinized Argrave. His body was a constant boiling ocean of alchemy able to reform what he had into whatever body parts he needed. Now, Argrave followed this hulking monstrosity through his abode of sterile obsidian. He was alone. The Brumasinas, Argrave's companions, all were outside, idle. The alchemist's silken black robe of hair sunk into his back as they walked, leaving a blank slate of ivory flesh behind. Slowly, lips formed, eyes just after them. You are a servant of Earl Abne? He asked from the newly formed lips, voice harsh and loud. The sight of the shifting flesh might have terrified Argrave had he not gone through the lower way in the past, yet more disquieting was the fact he was being asked any questions at all. He was not surprised the alchemist had seen through the blessing of supersession so easily, though. No, Argrave answered, suppressing the urge to add extraneous details. Answer only the question you are asked, he reminded himself, repeating it mentally like a mantra. The lips and eyes on the alchemist's back merged into one giant eyeball that shone with green light for but a moment. Argrave could see spell matrixes within the eye's pupil. Argrave knew not what the monstrous figure was doing, and he didn't dare ask. Soon enough, the eye was replaced by the black robe once again, 
and Argrave heaved a sigh of relief. There was much mystery surrounding the alchemist. Argrave had dedicated weeks of research to writing the wiki's article for this character. He had combed through countless in-game books, looking for references, even symbolic references, to link the alchemist to anything, a faction, a religion, a god. Argrave's experience with heroes of Berenda narrowed things down, but gave nothing concrete. Firstly, Argrave knew the alchemist had associated with an ancient god. He didn't know the details of this association, nor did he know which ancient god, nor any details beyond the fact that the two were linked. Secondly, Argrave knew the alchemist had once been mortal, and that his change was brought about by magic. Details were hazy on this end, too, some records claimed it was a hostile spell, others claimed it was a ritual taken willingly for the purpose of embodying alchemy. Thirdly, the alchemist was old, millennia old, at least. Argrave knew he was aware of Gerectic Kiet. He could be enlisted for the final battle, something Argrave was sure as hell going to do. Beyond that, the giant man before him remained a mystery. The alchemist was not receptive to questions. He was more apathetic than cruel, but he was also entirely intolerant of the most insignificant annoyances, questions being foremost among them. Argrave's personal conjecture was that the alchemist lived in such a secluded place to avoid people, and to avoid harming people, some of his dialogue expressed dissatisfaction with his rage, and guilt for wanton slaughter. But that was just that, conjecture. The alchemist came to a giant set of polished obsidian doors. He did not need to raise a hand, the doors started shifting aside as he neared. Argrave knew what was beyond. He had come here time and time again. Even still, it had been months since he had seen it, and viewing it in person was an infinitely more captivating thing. Shelves of polished obsidian rose up 100 feet into the air. The walls themselves seemed to emit a steady purple light making the place seem infinitely gloomier than it already was. The shelves held books, and every single book, without fail, had a white cover. A great many of them had lettering on the cover, even more were blank. Spread out across the room were obsidian tables. They looked like altars, in truth, but there was no discernible religious significance to them. Argrave had seen many libraries and studies of vast scale in his time on Berenda. He'd seen the libraries within the Order of the Grey Owls buildings, the ancient library in the Low Way of the Rose, and the Cold Stone Library in Veiden managed by Roe. None could compare to this place, at least not in scope. The alchemist stepped into the room. His arms stretched out as he retrieved many of the books with blank covers. The mini hands at the end of his fingers served to bring precision. With it, he effectively had ten normal-sized human hands, with which he adroitly maneuvered books and writing implements. Before long, the gargantuan robed figure turned to Argrave, five books held in his right hand with five writing implements in the other. Seeing the small hands on the tips of his finger clutched books and pens tightly was vastly disconcerting, so disconcerting, in fact, that he did not understand the alchemist's meaning immediately. Explain your trade. The alchemist instructed coldly once Argrave did nothing. He had already begun writing with two of his hands, perhaps noting his personal observations. Argrave straightened his back at once and ran through his planned lecture. He stepped to the closest obsidian table and laid out his things, then inhaled readying himself. This, Argrave pointed down to the grey, vaguely opaque heart. This is the Wraith's heart. It's a perfect mirror of a real human heart. Moreover, it has the capacity to take aspects of magical artifacts and embody them, if they are alchemized inside your body. Argrave pointed to the alchemist. The Wraith's heart can be considered empty, at present. The fell figure wrote down what Argrave said, each of his five small hands writing and moving diligently to inscribe on the blank books. To that end, these two items stand to fill the Wraith's heart emptiness. Argrave touched the purple rock on the table. Sensing the enchantments near it, veins rose and linked to Argrave's gloves. This is the amaranthine heart. It extracts vitality, or life force, from anything that it links to. It can additionally sap magic. What it absorbs can be extracted as liquid magic. Argrave pulled his finger away, and the veins of the heart snapped, fading into nothingness. A single dot of black liquid appeared atop it, like a drop of perspiration. Argrave stepped to the side and reached out for the Crimson Wellspring. This item is called the Crimson Wellspring. It is capable of converting most organic matter into blood. Unlike most other artificial bloods invented in the past, this one is capable of sustaining vampires, meaning it possesses genuine vitality. Argrave took a step back and gathered his thoughts. These two items, working in tandem inside the Wraith's heart, will serve to subvert some of my normal biological processes. Together, they can produce magic imbued blood. You have achieved something similar with chimeras, Argrave said, pointing to the alchemist. But the magic imbued blood proved corrosive. Yes, the body rejects false blood, the alchemist said, his first interjection. As such, we look to other creatures for a model, Argrave continued, undaunted. Creatures that have naturally occurring magic within their blood, dragons, wyverns, my pets the singers of the broom, certain species of elves. They all share one thing in common, their blood is not corrosive because their body creates it for them. It isn't the magic that is being rejected, the blood is being rejected. The alchemist ceased writing. He set some books down, then reached away, 
retrieving books that were not blank. Argrave barely saw diagrams of creatures, anatomies of the creatures he'd mentioned. The alchemist studied them. Argrave put his hand to his chest to ensure my body does not reject the magic blood. The third thing to be alchemized within the wraith's heart is to be my own heart, he explained, voice shaking somewhat. And further, it establishes the necessity for the unsullied knife. Argrave pointed to the scalpel on the obsidian table. Crude tools could not extract my heart and replace it with the alchemized wraith's heart without death, and that is the crux of the surgery, heart replacement. I know you are capable of that already. With those final words, Argrave exhaled. He reviewed what he had said, ensuring that nothing had been left out. The alchemist said nothing, moving with purpose throughout the library as he examined countless texts and wrote in his blank books. The weight was insufferable, but Argrave could only suffer it. The alchemist finally stopped moving about and stared down at Argrave. Will you tell me where you found these items? Argrave met the alchemist's grey-eyed gaze with his own. No. He shook his head. It was pointless to answer. Gratitude and offence were both equally impossible from the alchemist. Argrave gained nothing by answering, something that the player in Heroes of Berenda learned quickly. The alchemist very rarely rewarded the player for doing anything. One would fetch him an incredibly rare item and receive nothing in return. What do you believe will happen when this alchemized heart is placed within you? The alchemist questioned. It? Argrave swallowed. The man sounded like a doctor, asking a leading question. My body will have to reform itself to accommodate the magic within my blood. Everything within will change and morph. It will be very painful. Argrave finished. Yes. The alchemist nodded. It will. As such, I am establishing another condition to our trade. If your screams annoy me, I will take your larynx. Argrave blinked. Will I get it back after? No. Can't you just make a ward around me? You're an incomprehensibly powerful mage. Argrave wished to ask, but he'd already pushed his luck by asking one question. He nodded. Okay. The alchemist raised a hand up, pointing to the door. The mini hand on the tip of his finger pointed. To go. You will be led to a room on the outer wings of my castle. You will stay there during your period of change, so that I might observe these changes. I expect your companions to tend to your needs while you are here. They will be given access and informed of things. He lowered his hand. Once you arrive, strip. I will come when I am prepared. Argrave nodded once again, then turned. Beyond, the once dark hallway had been illuminated with purple lights, leading him down its path. He had been expecting such a sight. That conversation had been extremely disorienting and illogical. But Argrave felt that things had gone well, though, perhaps it was because it was only logical that it felt illogical, it didn't match a conversation between two normal humans. Though Argrave was carrying four fewer things in hand, his steps felt heavy. Heart surgery, he noted, and my surgeon is a whack job. Hash. Annalise kept a close watch on Drun and Garm, sitting amidst the giant bushes some distance away. She held her knees with her arms, and as she sat there, she tapped one foot against the ground rapidly. She hated this feeling more than anything she'd ever experienced. She was certain. Her gut writhed, her throat was clenched, and it felt like a notion of nervousness raged through her chest. Beneath it all was a thin sheet of anger and betrayal. All along the way, Argrave had expressed how dangerous this alchemist would be, and how they would need to be careful. Then, at the end, he tosses they to the wind, and goes to meet the man alone. Annalise knew he was right about this. It was for the best. Even still, she felt the need to rush in, join him. But, she wouldn't. So much had been put into this. Argrave had toiled for months grinding away at his own sanity, to achieve his goal. It was selfish, fundamentally, curing his sickly body, but there was a selfless purpose beyond it. Annalise would be certain that absolutely nothing went wrong. Maybe it was because it was the only thing she could do. Regardless, she kept focused on Duran and Garm. The jungle around her dulling her focus none. Gulliman touched her elbow. He held something out. Meat, she noticed. Wildlife is abundant here. Argrave was right, he said. I am not hungry. She shook her head. You can only wait. Gulliman said coldly, at least do it with a full stomach. She acknowledged his words with a frown and blinked a few times. Eventually, though, her gaze once more settled on the two ahead. Annalise did not bray often. She valued Vade and culture over its religion. Now, though, Vade, please protect our grave, she prayed. Chapter 147, Bearing Your Heart. Our grave recalled that he had once complained in an online forum about Fade to Black cutscenes in video games. The screen would go dark, and then someone would narrate what had happened. It's lazy. He recalled writing, Defs didn't want to animate a surgery. Argrave was sure he'd been about 15 years old when he wrote those nonsensical complaints. Now, Argrave wished for nothing more than his vision to fade to black and a month to pass. Instead, a 20-foot-tall giant wearing robes made of its own hairy arranged furniture to prepare for Argrave's heart surgery. He secretly hoped he'd have a panic attack and faint. The alchemist moved a table closer and placed a bowl of obsidian there. More and more things piled up beside Argrave and his breathing started to quicken as he questioned what, exactly, each implement would be for. Eventually, Argrave decided it would be best to stare at the ceiling. He saw the alchemist eat something, a collection of herbs, it looked like. Then, 
The man's finger retracted into itself, re-emerging as a dripping rod of bone. The alchemist held up a cup, filling it with a thin liquid the same color as the herbs he'd just consumed when the cup was filled. The alchemist held it to Argrave, imbibe, he commanded. Argrave sat up. It was very difficult to refrain from asking what he was to be imbibing. When he drank, it tasted like a subtle, leafy tea mixed with cough syrup. He laid back down, distinctly aware of it traveling through his body. The alchemist stood over him, staring down. Breathing will slow. Emotions will vanish. Blood will thicken, he commentated, watching. Should I be awake for this? He questioned internally, as if reading his mind. The alchemist continued, I would prefer you asleep or comatose but I obtain more information if you are alive and conscious. Observe my actions. You will write to report when I am finished. Argrave nodded, then waited. The alchemist merely stood over him, staring down. It wrote on blank books off to the side. Argrave realized it was drawing a diagram of him. Minutes passed, and Argrave merely stared around at the obsidian ceiling and the ivory-fleshed monstrosity looming above him. You have the faintest blood of a feathered serpent, he said. Vestigial remnants will change your period of adaptation. What does that mean? Argrave questioned, strangely. It did not panic him at all. It felt like it didn't matter, actually. He realized that his limbs felt very heavy. That didn't matter, either. He had no desire to do anything but lay here anymore. Even blinking was starting to feel cumbersome. The alchemist raised his hand up. One of his fingers grew an eye on its tip. He positioned it directly above Argrave's chest. It was eerily still, like it wasn't living at all. Off to the side. The alchemist's other fingers prepared implements. Foremost among them was the unsullied knife. As Argrave watched, he put things together calmly. Ah. He's using an eye like an endoscopic surgical camera, Argrave realized, and he mixed a potion inside his body that would suppress my functions, to make things easier for the surgery while allowing me to retain my consciousness. The unsullied knife drew near his flesh, the white scalpel's red inscriptions shone all the brighter in the alchemist's hands. Argrave felt nothing as it approached, fear, panic, all were gone. It touched his flesh, making the first incision, though, perhaps incision was not the right word. His flesh moved aside, bunching like clay, revealing bone beyond. The tool puts living things in a state of minor stasis, commented the alchemist. Souls, flesh, blood, all suspended. It interacts with all the realms of the world. This instrument could even excise the blessing of supersession that blooms with anew. The man spun the scalpel about in the small hands at the tips of his fingers. Provoking an ancient god in this manner could be very interesting. Something cut past the dull haze that had obscured Argrave's emotions, and his breathing grew a bit faster. Stop breathing. The alchemist chided. My next action will not be further warning. Argrave laid his head back against the table. The only thing he saw was the sleek obsidian ceiling. If I keep staring upwards, it's like a really long fade to black. Argrave realized he found some serenity in the constancy of the ceiling. The serenity was broken when one of the alchemist's fingers moved into view, a tongue-like implement holding something white. It was placed in a bowl. Argrave turned his head, looking at it. I think that's bone, he recognized. Refrain from observing distractions. The alchemist commanded, direct all attention towards the operation. First-hand experience and testimony add paramount details to all collected data. Argrave lifted his head up, staring at the sight below. To say the least of the situation, he saw much more of the color red than before. I think I'm going to have a nightmare about this later, Argrave reasoned. I'm sure this would be pretty disturbing if I had all my faculties. Your lungs have scarring. You should have been more careful. Huh. Guess he does have some compassion, Argrave thought. You are a terrible subject of comparison. The alchemist finished. You deviate far from all human norms, making you a poor control. Tall, frail of bone, weak, sickly organs, yet. Your body's adaptations to the magic integrating with your blood and flesh will be far more pronounced. That sounds more in character, Argrave concluded. Argrave watched his chest be ripped apart quietly, feeling neither intrigue nor disgust. As he sat there in his strange, emotion-free state, a thought came to mind. What if Duran and Garm did something to the artifacts? The thought bounced around in his head for a while. Well. I wouldn't become black-blooded, but I don't see how they could have done anything. What could he have done? Inject spirit goo into them? Ridiculous, yet. Certainly, Garm was alone with them a few times. He's usually by the backpacks, after all. All of them, save the amaranthine heart, were kept inside the lockbox. Argrave looked back to the growing pile of bones in a bowl beside him. I wonder if the alchemist would even put me back together if they didn't work, Argrave questioned. Well, they looked fine, but hell. I barely comprehend them as is. How would I know if something was wrong with any of them? Realizing nothing could be done, Argrave turned his head back. Oh. There's my heart, bigger than I thought. The alchemist's finger eye lowered into Argrave's body, while another hand conjured spell light. All the while, the unsullied knife grew ever closer. I suppose I'm about to find out. Hash. Durant stepped out of the jungle, positioning his glay eye to block the sunlight that buffeted his eyes. As the whiteness induced by sudden sunlight settled, what he saw beyond was not at all what he expected to see. They must have been in a cave atop a mountain near its summit, for clouds were just below them, p. 
peaks jutting up above. The clouds were thick and dense, almost prompting one to try and stand on them. Nonetheless, they concealed much of the environment ahead. Darren could only barely make out a field of green. They were definitely far from the burnt desert. Despite where they had entered from, he stepped closer, transfixed. A single giant tree hung out over the ledge, drooping down off the side of the mountain. Darren was close enough to the clouds that he could see them move, but he had seen moving clouds plenty aback his wife and, instead, he watched beyond, staring at the fields of green. Darren had heard tell of the northern lands. But he'd never seen them. He didn't know where this cave was. He didn't even know if the sight ahead was real. All he knew was that they were far from the burnt desert. Come look at this. Darren turned round, calling out in his excitement. He was greeted by a pair of ever-watching amber eyes. Annalise clearly had not slept at all during their night in this strange realm. She took Hargrave's directive very seriously, obviously. Darren couldn't help but feel a bit ostracized when their distrust was so blatantly displayed, but then. Perhaps he had no right to complain, considering their distrust was warranted. We're far from the burnt desert. Garm noted from Durin's hands. I thought the same, Durin turned back around, lands of eternal green. I hope to see them someday. Poured sand from my boots enough times, now I'm looking to put my gaze on something new. You will, assured Garm. Durin moved up to the edge and sat down, laying his glay eye out. There was no wind at all. Strangely enough, winds would surely be incredibly harsh this high up, provided this was a normal place. Instead, things remained as pleasant as ever. The giant tree leaning out beside him resembled a willow. Even its branches were undisturbed. He watched for a long while. Durant still had much disturbing his thoughts. The business at Sethia was one that couldn't be put to bed in a couple days. Fortunately, as things were shaking out, he was to be spending a month here. With a final sigh, Durant rose to his feet. As he turned, he spotted something emerge from the jungle behind Annalise. She must have noticed his expression change because she turned quickly and stepped away. A figure of dancing black smoke stood before her. It had no discernible features, but Durin could have sworn that it was looking around. Your companion informed me only one of you would suffice for dealing with him. A harsh voice echoed out, and Durin took a step back. He said he would prefer Annalise. Go. The lights will lead you. The black smoke exploded outwards as though blasted by a great gale, dispersing into nothingness. Durin watched the tall snow elf breathe quicker probably panicking. Without a word, she rushed out into the jungle. Darren adjusted his position, calming himself. Looks like the time is now. He muttered, clenching Garm a little tighter. Just then, Glimmon stepped out of the jungle. One hand held his ebon ice axe, still dripping with blood. The other held a cat-like creature Darren had never seen before. It resembled a cougar, though with bizarre stripes and much more mass on its frame. What time might that be? Glimmon questioned. Darren inhaled, then adjusted his footing. He bent down and retrieved his glay eye. You're right. He really does hear everything. Stop being a fool, Garm chided. Put down the glay eye. That one is a monster beyond your capability. Who decided that? Durin stepped forward. Gulliman, Garm called out, and only then did Durin halt. Gulliman dropped the body he held, and it fell to the dirt below. The giant elf said nothing, waiting for Garm to continue. I think we should talk, Garm continued, because what I wish to do, it can benefit you, if you wish it. Gulliman took steady steps forward. I don't think you've learned anything about me. Beginning with that, I am Argrave's shield. I will tolerate nothing that subverts his goal. No boon will sway me, no opponent will deter me. Hear me out, Garm insisted. I know you better than you think. I hope we can talk about this amicably, at the very least. Glimmon stopped moving forward. Fine. I should warn you, though. I am quite good at throwing axes. Try nothing. He waved the ebon ice axe in his hand. I'm glad you're the one left, Garm smiled. You might be the only one who would let me go through with this. Chapter 148 Make an effort. Annalise stepped through the bizarre palace of the alchemist, following the purple lights that shone without an obvious source. They guided her through the complex place. Typically, her eyes wandered at times like these, consumed with curiosity, but she was led forward now with a single-minded purpose. She passed through a threshold into another room. The trail of lights faded. She saw a bed in the back of the room. It was a fancy one, a four-poster bed, hanging curtains of purple fabric with strange designs on them. Its fanciness seemed in stark contrast with the rest of the place. Annalise stepped forward towards the bed. She saw a pair of feet sticking off the end, and as she grew closer, she ducked low and looked. Argrave laid the beneath purple blankets, holding a white book in his hands. It was blank, and he busied himself with filling it out. As she stared down at him, he looked up at her. You're here. Look at this, he complained. The man couldn't even get me a bed large enough for my whole body. You'd think a giant like him would have some sympathy for the people on the taller end of the spectrum, but number. He makes me leave my feet hanging, Argrave. She stepped closer. What is? What is wrong with you? I can. I cannot. Oh. He gave me some liquid, Argrave explained, voice without much vigor. Not feeling very emotional right now, to put it simply, should fade. I hope. Her eyes darted around frantically, scanning him as she drew closer. Take a look at this. Argrave pulled down the blankets, 
revealing his pale, bony chest. Not a scar in sight. You wouldn't believe how bad I looked not too long ago. I'm a little disappointed, honestly. Wouldn't mind a nice scar, right down the center. He traced his sternum with his fingers. Annalise sat on the purple bed just beside him, eyes locked on him. But what? What did he? What exactly? How did it? How did it go? She babbled. Argrave shrugged. I'm not sure, really. Apparently, the same potion he gave me to dull my emotions is stopping my new heart from doing its thing. Argrave touched his chest. My new heart's a... I don't know. It's a magenta color, I guess, and it glows. Argrave looked up. The alchemist said he'd be back in a few hours when the blood starts pumping. He advised I eat plenty. But how do you feel? She asked, her speech finally normalizing somewhat. Pretty weak. Can't move much. And I think... And maybe I'm just being delusional. Argrave looked at himself. I think I can already vaguely feel the pain coming. The changes. He shook his head. Well, whatever. I have to write this report. As Argrave raised the book, ready to resume his task, Annalise practically fell forth atop him, hugging him fiercely, just as quickly. She pulled away. Forgive me, she apologized. No, forget that. I am not sorry for being glad you are well. But, she sighed and lowered her head, white hairs playing out across the purple blankets. I was worried. I still am. If the ivory man hadn't filled my veins with apathy juice, I'd probably be a lot more worried than you are, Argrave noted. Well, that sounds a bit dismissive. I'm glad you were worried. He paused. That sounds worse, doesn't it? Annalise laughed heartily like all the tension built within was being dispelled with each laugh, she stood. You said the alchemist is to return? That's right. Make sure everything is in order, that sort of thing. If I'm to be given a diagnosis of terminal death, it'll probably come then. Argrave nodded. I will stay with you, she said. Who knows what will occur after such a strange happening? You need someone by your side. We discussed. That was my decision. Save your words. She shook her head. Argrave stared her in the face. Her amber eyes were steady and determined. He could see how tired she was, yet nonetheless, he sighed, then set his book down. All right, if I start moaning and groaning when my body begins to accept the new blood, don't make fun of me, okay? I don't need any shame with the pain. She knew he was only joking and smiled as she made for the door. Write your report. I will get you food, as the alchemist advised. This brings me back, Argrave called out, picking up his book once again. To what? She paused at the threshold. Me, sick in bed. You, taking care of me, going to fetch food. Argrave reminisced. This time stands to last a bit longer than our time in Vaiden. Bringing dried meat again? She stepped back into the room a little. Would you like that? Argrave raised a brow. Anything's fine, little lady. Don't trouble yourself. Hopefully this is the last time I need do such a thing, she commented. Though, I have no problem with it. I'll be as hale as a hare when this is done. Argrave assured. Glimmer coming, too? The other two? She shook her head. Presumably, I am unsure. I ran off possessed once I was informed of things. She shook her head. I will keep an eye out. Argrave shook his head, then said in faux sadness, You learn who your friends really are on your deathbed, looks like. Please do not joke about that. She shook her head. Argrave laughed, then picked up his book. Ought to get back to the slave labor. By the way, could you grab that bronze hand mirror? It's in my pack just outside. Annalise nodded and moved away. Thanks, Annalise, he called out. She waved as she left. Argrave opened the book, trying to find where he'd left off writing. Hash. Annalise will not be pleased, noted Gilliman, sitting cross-legged. Your protection is bound to her by honor, a contract. Honor, is it? She won't care that I'll be dead? Garm laughed, stuck in the dirt just beside Ren. They sat around a fire, cooking the striped cat. Whatever, I make my choices. Me. Not her, not our newly black-blooded friend. This has nothing to do with our grave. It's my choice. Mine. I will not allow them to interfere in that. She'll care, Gilliman nodded. Our grave will, too. He shook his head. You won't? I understand what it's like to crave death, Glimmon said as he stared into the fire. Was never brave enough to go through with it. Ha 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 ha. Garm laughed, shown up by a talking head. Why do you do this? Glimmon asked. Because I'm a burden, Garm said contemptuously. I know what it will take for me to gain a body that I'm satisfied with. It would be as difficult as becoming black-blooded, I suspect. Months of work, all to give me a barely passable body with not an iota of my former power. I'm dead weight. Glimmon crossed his arms. Yet you're selfless enough to go through with this? My whole life, people have disappointed me. My parents, all my friends, my teachers, my students. They never made the effort I made. Garm looked at Glimmon. And now, I've met some people who wouldn't disappoint me. I'm certain all of you would do as much for me as I am willing for you. Found what you wanted. So you lend it all, without reason? There's reason, Garm refuted. Our grave fights some ancient calamity. He needs no dead weight least of all a snarky bastard like myself. His golden eyes turned to Duran, at the very least, he'll have a bit of bastard like Duran, who can carry his weight. And then some, Duran scratched his cheek. Yeah, fighting a god, fun hobby, 
looking to try it out. He nodded. Gulliman ran his hand through his white hair. What's your plan for this alchemist? Argrave probably doesn't know this. But I know about the alchemist, too. Some high wizards engaged with him, at some point. Plenty of writings about the freak. Garm closed his eyes. My existence is special. Ascension necromantic creation. He'll have interest in studying me, I'm sure. Is it enough to ask what you intend of him? Gulliman adjusted his sitting position. I'm sure he'll be eager to test out the unsullied knife more, Garm reasoned, opening his eyes once again. If worse comes to worse, the alchemist won't let me transcribe every spell I remember. But I'm certain I can bind my soul to drones. Darin rubbed at his chest at the mention of souls. The soul's not in the chest, idiot, Garm rebuked. Don't act all terrified. Darin lowered his hand, just nauseated, thinking about merging with you, that's all. He shot back. Yeah, yeah, Garm coaxed. Let it out. Tough guy, Gulliman looked to the fire. What will happen when souls merge? One dominates the other, Garm explained. It's eaten, more or less. A very risky thing for two souls of equal power to go at each other. It's a game of chance and will at the point, and the loser is erased utterly. This situation is incomprehensibly rare. Fortunately for Duran, my soul is damaged quite badly. That bodes ill for my future. Duran crossed his arms. Yes, your damaged goods. That much is obvious. Then what is the benefit? Gulliman tilted his head. Memory. Garm succinctly explained, when a soul overwrites another, vestiges remain, if it's a swordsman's soul that's eaten, the winning soul will learn a sword very, very quickly, until you catch up with the person's skill, in the case of spells, any spell I've learned, or any tier of magic I've breached, Duran will have an easy go of things, hand held through all the challenges in life, like a kid with rich parents, sounds useful, Gulliman crossed his arms, why is it rare, well, souls are fleeting things, Garm continued, need something like the unsullied knife, for stability, things that can facilitate such a procedure are rare, and closely guarded, and not all souls are compatible, if there's a drastic difference in personality, well, it's about as useful as doing nothing at all, Gulliman nodded as though things fell into place, I'll help, but I'll come with you, if either of you requests anything untoward of the alchemist, I'll land you there, even if I perish, my primary duty remains protecting our grave, I sympathize with your plight, but I will not compromise on his safety, yes, yes, Garm said dismissively, I understand, on the front of our grave. If you could, I'd like to write a letter, to him, to Annalise. Darren looked like he had something to say but refrained. I can do that, Gulliman nodded. You should write of the soul, and merging souls, to our grave. He, the soul in his body is not the body's original. I believe he could gain something from your wisdom. Garm raised a brow, I'd ask more, but a dead man doesn't need to know much of anything. All right, I can do that, Garm confirmed. Another thing, Gulliman, about that benefit I mentioned. What? The vampire questioned, rising to his feet. My eyes, he began. They're valuable. I was an A-rank mage, once. They can see things, people's magic strength, for instance. And they can better discern illusions. No illusion magic will affect you, should you inherit them. Not to mention. My vision is damned flawless. Do you want them? Gulliman frowned, staring at those black and gold eyes all too similar to those belonging to the abominable creatures within the low way. I'm a vampire. That may cause problems. You're a vampire? Darren repeated incredulously. Is no one in this? Not now. Darren, Garm dismissed. It shouldn't cause problems, not if the alchemist fixes things. Your eye color won't even change. It might take a couple months, but it'll correct itself, and you can keep those shining whites you have. I don't want your eyes. Gulliman shook his head. Another could use them better. All right, Garm pursed his lips. Guess I'll offer them to Argrave or Annalise. Darren looked utterly flabbergasted. Boy, Garm called out, pulling him from his thoughts. My soul is to become a part of you. Moreover, you'll inherit my spell collection provided the alchemist allows me to write it out, yet allow me to make one thing clear, even if I'm gone, bits of me will remain, like a lingering ghost, if you act against our grave, or Gulliman, if you hinder them, I'll tear you apart from the inside, you will support them with all you have until Gerectic Kiet is dead and gone, not even sure this mythical being is real, Durin countered, what if it's all bogus, what if our grave's lying, Garm laughed, I thought like you, once, our grave will change that thinking quickly enough, if he doesn't, I'll let you leave, Garm took a deep breath and exhaled loudly. All right. He shouted. Time to end this miserable existence. Are you sure you wish to cast your life away? Gulliman questioned. I died 600 years ago. I was merely trapped until now, Garm answered coldly. I always thought about freedom, trapped as I was. I longed for it. It became an obsession. When I thought of freedom, I thought of flying. But I have flown aback Durin's wyvern. Garm closed his eyes. Now I think of freedom. And dream of dying. Chapter 149. Unpredictable insurmountable. Argrave laid in bed, staring up at the bronze hand mirror he'd once so loathed owning. Traits, tall, black-blooded, intelligent, magic of inity, high, insomniac, blessing of supersession, max, skills, elemental magic, c, locked, blood magic, c, locked, healing magic, c, locked, 
Illusion magic, C. Locked, warding magic, C. Locked, druidic magic, C. Locked, inscription, E. Imbuing, E. Two accursed traits that had plagued him ever since he'd arrived at this place were now completely absent. Something else had taken their place, something glorious and black and bloody. He might have been alarmed by the giant words reading locked beside every rank of magic he'd learned but he'd been expecting such a thing. His magic pool had diminished significantly, he was only capable of casting spells of D rank. Now, what does it say? Questioned Annalise. It says things that make me very, very happy, Argrave answered, setting the mirror beside him on the bed. Hot damn, I want to dance. He cleared his throat. When marimba rhythms start to play, dance with me, make me sway. He sung. Annalise smiled. You are just as bad as singing as last time. Argrave laughed. I know, I know. I've got no talent, I'm flat. But do you know what I am talented at? Or rather, will be? Argrave pointed a finger. I can think of some, she nodded. Flattering statement, little lady. Argrave lowered his finger. Henceforth, I will grow as a mage with ridiculous speed. Unprecedented. My magic will replenish faster than you can blink. I can diminish it just as fast repaying that massive magic debt I accrued at Sethia. I suspect that'll happen before we even leave this place. Each time I do this cycle, it'll grow a little larger, a little larger. Argrave held his fingers close together, and then widened them. Before long, I won't even need the blessing of supersession. My magic pool will be larger. Argrave paused, then recanted. All right, that's one hell of an exaggeration. But still, Annalise moved to sit on the bed. Your emotions are returning. Does that mean? Argrave nodded. I wasn't being delusional. I feel it coming on. It's like... Argrave paused. You remember, when you were young, you'd feel this weird aching, throbbing, in your legs. Growing pains, some called them. She looked to her legs, thinking, and then nodded. I think so, she confirmed. Well, it's like that. But all over, Argrave moved his hands around, touching various places. And... It's getting worse. Things have only just begun. A voice echoed throughout the room. The alchemist stepped inside. Argrave clammed up immediately and focused his gaze on the returned giant. Annalise stood from the bed, coming to attention, yet remained quiet otherwise. The bed shook with every step he took. Soon enough, he came to stand over Argrave's four-poster bed, his upper half concealed by the bed frame. He held his hand out, and the fingers retracted within. A great eye opened on the now fingerless palm. The grey pupil shone with spell matrixes, darting about and scanning Argrave's body. Annalise stepped back, startled. Then bravely stepped back and sat beside our grave. If I were to open your chest once again, we might see the heart working. Blood enters it normally and exits changed. Insignificant, now, but in time it will all be replaced. Black-blooded, the alchemist walked around the bed. You must eat much. If you do not, you will be eaten from within and die. Avoid biting your tongue from the pain. Be cautious of seizures, too. The alchemist rubbed his fingers together. In addition, waste will be forcibly expelled from the body. At the peak, I suspect you will begin sweating, vomiting and defecating blood. It will leave no lasting damage, I suspect. In addition, your skin, hair, and nails may fall off, regrow. I am uncertain of this. All test subjects and chimeras die by this point. Generally, our grave swallowed. Your bones, organs, muscles, etc., will all adapt to the changes in time. Bones will grow larger, gain strength. Your muscles will exhibit no visible changes, but they will morph as well. Your organs will become much more efficient as magic permeates throughout your body. The alchemist stepped to the bed's nightstand and retrieved Argrave's report. In essence, everything your body does will become better, exemplar, muscle growth, the same effort will produce tremendously improved results. Alcohol, poisons, and many potions will dissolve from the intensity of the magic in your blood. The alchemist flipped through Argrave's written report, reading as he spoke. Infection and disease become impossibilities. Wounds will heal better, and faster. He continued, that same principle wards away aging to a large degree. The alchemist shut the book with a light pop. Sufficient, was his sole comment for the report. I tell you this because I expect you to keep noting these things. You will describe what occurs within, daily, and continue to be subject to my scrutiny. In return, you will receive my continued tolerance of your presence within my home and garden. Elsewise, you and yours will be banished. I agree, then, Argrave nodded. Any rules to note for my stay? Do not pester me needlessly. Beyond that, my other condition remains in place. Argrave nodded. The alchemist set the book back down on the nightstand and left, his exit jarringly abrupt. The both of them sat in stunned silence for a long while. Eventually, Argrave took a deep breath and sighed. Surgeons aren't much better than lawyers in terms of arrogance. What other condition? Annalise questioned, ignoring his little quip. If I scream too loud, he'll take my larynx, Argrave explained, staring at the blankets atop him. Larynx? She repeated. Throat. Thing. Argrave held a hand to his throat. Let me talk. Breathe. Too. I think. Not sure. She stared at him. How loud is too loud? You. 
Argrave trailed off, loud enough to annoy him. Annalise sighed, a simple enough thing to combat. I will make sure no sound gets out. Still, what a terrifying man. I'm curious. What did you feel from him? It is not a feeling, per se, Annalise explained. It is more of reading their body, their face than something external. I cannot read animals, nor things drastically different from humans or elves. The only reason I was able to read those creatures in the low way was because their basis was human, and I cannot read him. His movements are all far too foreign. Argrave nodded. That's fine. Still, I was hoping for something to make this nonsense less nonsensical. Do not be nervous, Annalise reassured. I vowed that absolutely nothing would go wrong, and I will be sure of that, even now. Argrave did feel reassured by that knowing they were more than empty words coming from her. No sight of Gilliman and Orderin? She looked frustrated. No. I saw nothing of them. It is a vast jungle, granted, but I did not think it dangerous. And I did not think they would not care about your well-being. She shook her head. I will go look for them, if you wish it. I can fetch more to eat, too. It would be a good to stock up. I mean, I got what I came here for. I don't think they can take that away. Argrave clenched the blankets tight. But Drin and Garm were definitely being shady. Hash. I refuse, said the alchemist plainly and loudly, voice ever grating on the ears. Garm stared up at the gargantuan man, his pupils shaking. Darren and Gilliman stood within the vast library that Argrave had discussed his surgery in. Garm held in Gilliman's hand. Though the area had been clean and tidy when Argrave left barring some misplaced books, it was now strewn with innumerable books containing diagrams and long paragraphs of data, some of them seemed to be wholly numbers. Why? Garm questioned against his better judgment. The alchemist raised his nose up into the air and vague cracks echoed out around his neck. I will not be party to killing something that I have interest in. He said plainly, though his voice was noticeably lower in pitch, a necromantic creation that retains its sentience, retains its soul in toto, barring foolish, unnecessary damages that seem to have been self-inflicted by a B-rank spell, that is interesting indeed. Worthy of study, certainly. Glimmon shifted on his feet, looking to Garm in his hand. But I told you, I'll allow you to study me until the black-blooded one recovers, a process taking a month at most, insufficient time to draw my interest enough to do as you wish. The alchemist concluded, staring down at Garm. I have other things to offer, Garm continued. Spells of the Order of the Rose. The alchemist turned around and walked back into the library, saying nothing in response. It was clear he had no interest in further conversation. What would it take, then? Garm called out. Cracking bones echoed throughout the obsidian library as through the alchemist was popping his neck out fingers. He came to a stop. Rather than turn, the hair on his scalp proceeded within, and a face identical to the one on the front took its place. His front side carried on unaffected, staring down and writing into a book as he spoke from the face on his back. Surrender yourself to me, completely. The alchemist said, voice another pitch lower, and refrain from this foolishness of merging souls. I can still deliver your eyes to the black-blooded one. I will allow you to write down what spells you know. In return, submit. The tests will last some years, depending on how they go, I may allow you to die when they are finished, he finished apathetically. Duran lowered his gaze to the ground, raising his brows and shaking his head as if resigned to things. Glimmon remained patient, staring down at Garm. But I, I'll do things myself, then I'll be gone forever, no opportunity for anyone any longer, Garm threatened, desperation very evident. More cracking and popping filled the room. The book the alchemist held slammed shut, echoing throughout the library. The face on the back of his head sunk away, replaced by hair and the alchemist turned to face Garm. How sad. The alchemist said, voice now as deep and guttural as Gilliman's, though magnitudes more powerful. Garm. Gilliman cautioned, already stepping away towards the hall. You have to help, Garm said resolutely. At once. The odd cracking of bones turned into a deafening noise, like the sound of a giant tree finely breaking and splintering. The alchemist's movements were barely discernible, and he arrived before the three of them in not a second. His hair rose and writhed as if alive and his rigid back bent down face contorting into one giant eye that stared at Garm while shining with green light. A mouth opened on the alchemist's stomach, wide enough to swallow Gilliam and Holland with teeth the size of Garm himself. A black mist poured out of his ears, eye, and mouth, dancing up into the air. His hair surrounded Garm, each strand like threatening needles. Why is that? The alchemist asked, each word spoken slowly and deliberately. His voice could be likened to the devil itself, so terrifying it had become, as the needle-thin strands of hair poked at his skin, drawing blood. Garm's gaze remained steady, because you want to stop Gerectic Kiet as much as anyone in this world, and Argrave stands to be the vanguard against him, Garm answered, I want to help him, this is the best way I have, besides, you get to use the unsullied knife more, doubtless you're eager to, the alchemist became still for a moment, then, he began to pull away, Gerectic Kiet, said the colossal mouth on his stomach, emphasizing the harsh portions of the word, the mouth groaned loudly, then slowly, the lips sealed shut, fading away into flesh until naught but ivory skin remained. Duran had fallen to the floor at some point, and he slowly stood up, 
head moving about frantically. Even Gilliman had shied away. Get out. The alchemist commanded. Be gone. I must. He trailed off, his speech hesitating for the first time any present could recall. All were eager to obey this directive, exiting as quickly as their feet would allow. The alchemist looked up to the ceiling. He stared silently for a long while, then let out a long, contemptuous groan. Annoying, he said, voice returned to its normal pitch. Chapter 150, Blood, Bile, and All Things Vile. Gar mouthed off to the alchemist. Argrave questioned while rubbing his chest, taking deliberate and heavy breaths. Annalise had placed some accommodations in the room, the end of the bed had a chair to accommodate Argrave's dangling feet, and she had placed a large couch just beside the bed for herself. In addition, some food was ready and stocked. The pain was beginning in earnest. It was a constant dull ache, rising ever upwards in intensity. It had been manageable at first, ignorable, even. But it kept growing and growing, becoming all-consuming. It reminded Argrave, strangely enough, of having eaten something incomprehensibly spicy. The pain appeared tame for a time, half a minute, maybe. But the fire would keep growing, consuming one's throat, one's mouth, with such a steady pace that the moment seemed to last forever. Unlike a hot pepper's spice. There was no respite from this pain. No milk, nothing to offer temporary relief. It was just an ache rising ever higher, like a room slowly flooding. The worst part was that Argrave saw no ceiling in sight. It stood to keep growing, eating away more and more at all other sensations. The uncertainty bred nervousness, fear. A month of this, Argrave told himself mentally. This is nothing. First step on the stair, got to be better. Dot and so they refused to enter, Annalise said. Argrave looked at her, realizing she'd been talking while he'd been lost in thought. Sorry got lost in my own world. He confessed. They ran into the alchemist, and he told them to get out of their sight after some words, she summarized what she had said quickly. Now. They fear retribution, so they stay far from the castle. A stab of pain seized our grave's head, and he inhaled through clenched teeth, veritably hissing. Useless imbeciles, he said loudly, his own voice echoing in his head. What good are they? Annalise looked off to the side, saying nothing. Damn it all, our grave cursed. No. They're not imbeciles. Pain. Pain makes you irritable. Forget what I said. The stabbing subsided in his head, and once it did, he interrogated further, what the hell did they say to the man? They avoided the subject. Annalise crossed her arms. Christ, I might be pissing blood soon, and they're playing about with our local twenty-foot-tall psychopath. Argrave stroked his head, his shouting making his headache worse. I can't catch a break, even now? Annalise stared at him patiently. Is there anything you need? Yeah, Argrave nodded. Choke me until I'm unconscious. See you tomorrow. He gave a salute. She lowered her head, unamused by his joke. I'm sorry, he apologized. Maybe you. Maybe you shouldn't be here. I'm just going to be a moody prick for days on end. No one deserves to be subject to that, least of all. He shook his head. Just go, join Gilliman. I made up my mind, Argrave, she said simply without a moment's hesitation. You expect me to leave you to fend for yourself, could you? We know not how bad this will get, she pointed out. But. The alchemist entered. His steps seemed heavier than normal. Somehow, Argrave tensed, quieting and sitting up in the bed. Wordlessly, the alchemist came to stand before Argrave. He held his hand out, an eyeball forming within his palm once more. His grey eye shone with spell light, like this. The alchemist stood there, as still and shiny as a nightstand lamp. Argrave stayed silent, doing his best to make even his breathing quiet as he waited for whatever the alchemist was doing. MMMM. He groaned for nearly a minute, voice low. I see it now. You descend from that golden serpent. Vasca. She had a union with a man. Hideous thing. The alchemist began to walk around the bed, hand remaining stationary. It reminded Argrave of the way a chicken's head could stay totally still as it moved, after a long while where Argrave cast uncertain glances at Annalise. The alchemist finally closed his hand. A finger extended towards Argrave. The mini hand on the finger's tip grabbed Argrave's cheeks, and his eyes widened in surprise. The alchemist's skin was surprisingly rough, despite being white and smooth looking. Argrave tried to keep his face firm, but his cheeks were soon squished by an indomitable force, not enough to hurt but enough to move him, certainly. Not that Argrave could notice if it did hurt, what with the all-consuming pain of his black blood integrating with his body. Annalise stood and stepped towards the bed, her expression morphed by surprise. She looked concerned but hesitated to act. You talk frequently. The muscles in your face, signs of non-stop chatter, laughter, smiles. The alchemist noted. Argrave felt some strain on his neck as he was lifted upwards somewhat. He raised his hand up, hesitant to stop the alchemist. Before he could make up his mind, Argrave was released suddenly. Falling back to the bed. Every time I listen to this room, I hear your babbling. Inane complaints, witticisms, delusions of grandeur made grander by gullibility. Argrave stared indignantly with brows furrowed and eyes wide, massaging his face in confusion. Words, words, words. There are too many in the world. 
The alchemist said. Words fail half the time. What good are words in a battle? Silence filled the room for a while. Argrave figured it was a rhetorical question, and so he stayed silent. Stop thinking. Answer. The alchemist commanded, and Argrave scrambled in the bed. Words. Argrave trailed off, before finishing. Got me here. A lie. You have feet, legs, all connected to a brain by system so complex your words fail to describe them. They render you ambulatory, not words. You walked here. Words, be they on paper or spoken, carry no one anywhere. I really don't need this right now, Argrave thought, brain dancing to find the answer. It's a metaphor, Argrave rebutted. Useless things, the alchemist stated, voice a pitch lower. This alarmed Argrave very much, because he knew it was a sign of anger. Words are a veneer. Metaphor is yet another facade atop this veneer, another step to remove and obscure purity of the mind's thought. Argrave noted the irony that the alchemist had used a metaphor to disparage metaphors, but he focused on what the alchemist meant. The purity of the mind's thought, Argrave repeated. There is no other method of communication so universal and sophisticated as words. Pain shot up Argrave's arm, and he winced, but kept his thoughts focused on the titan looming above his bed. Words are the best way for the common and the grand to understand each other's thoughts. And universal understanding. That's a powerful thing, Argrave finished through clenched teeth, gripping his arm tightly. Words foster that. NNN. The alchemist groaned once again, a vast mouth on his stomach opening up. Black smoke started to rise up into the high ceiling. He walked to the wall. It parted like burning twigs twisting from a flame, revealing the jungle beyond. Argrave started to worry that he was about to experience an elaborate eviction because he lost a debate he didn't understand. I hate talking most of all, the alchemist said, pure contempt showing on his voice a rare divergence from the constant apathy, no different from assault, why must I suffer your thoughts, I have my own to deal with, thoughts infinitely more important, not wishing to make the same mistake as last time, Argrave answered, why n, be silent, the alchemist interrupted, talking is an assault, yet it is the strangest form of assault, doing no genuine harm, the spoken word plants itself within your mind like a parasite, worming and changing and feeding on the valuable thoughts within, corrupting, morphing, violating the sanctity, the purity, of the hallowed, thoughts within, the alchemist turned and the wall shut, hiding the jungle away once again. The spoken word is an insidious killer. Harmless, fools say. But in time, the words batter at the mind, until the you that once was is only a memory, and your thoughts of the past become foreign. It kills that you that once was. Recluses go to any lengths to justify their lifestyle. Argrave thought drolly, finding some amusement amidst the tense atmosphere and pain racking his body. But when the time for words has passed, and mindless hordes charge each other, spite in their gut, Everything blends into the song of war, and true metal will be tested. The alchemist walked back to stand before Argrave's bed. He stayed there for a long while, doing nothing. Argrave could not relax his vigilance. He sat there, alert and awake, preparing for any eventuality. Without another word, the alchemist turned and walked out of the room. Argrave stared at the threshold like the man might re-emerge at any time. A minute passed, another. Finally, Argrave collapsed back into the bed, feeling exhausted. What in the goddamn was that about, Argrave? Annalise came to sit in the bed. Argrave kept his eyes on her. She reached out, then touched the back of his neck. When she pulled her hand away, blood was on her fingers. Argrave kept his eyes on that for a long while. He said it would happen. Argrave said grimly. Sweating blood, I guess. Time to find out if I'd crack under torture, Argrave concluded. Hash. Argrave was certain of only one thing, time had passed. As the pain grew worse and worse, it became difficult to note anything beside the passing of time. Every moment felt eternal. The symptoms ascended beyond mere pain and Argrave felt like he was losing his mind. All that the alchemist promised would happen, did, all that and more. The once clean room became a disgusting mess, but Argrave was too consumed with simply getting by. With more pressing concerns, Argrave could not be appalled by his own state. He was beset by a constant hunger, eating at him. He drank water and consumed food so frequently the taste of anything became nauseating, but his body never rejected what he ate. Indeed, it seemed to desperately take it in. If he didn't tend to it, the hunger and thirst became another source of pain. With everything going on, sleep became an impossibility. Argrave laid in his bed, shivering, beset by strange cold sweats. He raised his fiercely trembling hands to the dim light in the room. He saw that his nails were black and blue. He suspected they'd fall off. Soon enough, there was something else constant, or rather, someone. Annalise. She rested on the couch, taking the time to sleep. Annalise. He called out, voice still steady despite everything. She roused at once head lifting up and eyes coming to attention like she wasn't sleeping at all. Perhaps she wasn't. What is it? Do you need something? You should. Go outside, he said, interrupted by a shiver. Why? Do you need something? Take it slow, she urged, moving off the couch to kneel by the bed. I don't. Want you here, he managed through clenched teeth. Despite the harsh words, she remained steady. Why? She questioned. Hate being seen like this, Argrave growled. Most of all, by you. 
of everyone in the world never want you to see me like this. Annalise laid her head on the bed and waited for a few silent moments. Then, she lifted her gaze once more. Argrave, do you know what I would hate? Argrave shook his head. He wasn't sure if the gesture was conveyed, because he was shaking enough it might be ambiguous. I would hate letting you remain like this, alone, miring in your own misery. I cannot abide that. Argrave closed his eyes when she said that. After all that had happened, he was finding it a little difficult not to cry. He felt a strange tenseness in his hand. He feared a new symptom and opened his eyes to look. Annalise held his hand, offering silent support. Empty your head of these emotions of embarrassment, shame. She shook her head. Focus on yourself. Forget about the world. Argrave turned his head away from her, staring off into the room. Nothing needed to be said, by his estimation. She would know what he felt. And he wasn't sure it would be especially well received from one covered in blood. At least, that was his excuse. If you like this audiobook, Subscribe the channel for more videos like this. And join my Patreon if you want to support me, where you can find the complete collection Jekyll Among Snakes audiobooks. Hurry up, what are you waiting for? Leave some comment and let me know if you guys like this story, or you have a web novel you like and want to hear its audiobook. I will be happy to create them for you. Please like, share, and leave a comment on the video.